with me this morning to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, we've kind of gone in this emotion series from uh, uh, Genesis and, and jumped forward and then just keep going back here, but I want to conclude this series this morning from Genesis chapter 3, looking at the, the very first temptation uh, that was brought upon a woman and man. And uh, I just got to say this, I've said it several times and I want you to get it, God created us as emotional people. Now, guys, that's not all bad. That's not all bad. Sometimes we would say, well, that's just a woman thing. It's really not. God gave men and women, gave all of us emotions. We just tend to hide them maybe a little bit better. With the exception of, you know, excitement at a ball game or when you catch a big fish or something like that, you know, then our emotions come out. Or sometimes our emotions come out in a form of anger and other those. We're just not, you know, touchy-feely, weepy, uh, you know, kitten and caterpillar type emotion people. But we are emotional people. I experienced some emotions last night where we had gone uh, to see my parents down in College Station for a couple of days and... We're coming back up about Goodlett. You know where Goodlett is? Just south of Childress a little bit, right before you get to that Pease River Cowboy Church. And all of a sudden, I look up, and some guy, I'm not going to give him a name, but some man, had to be a man, must have been driving a, a dump truck or something, and he, he had, had, uh, had let out several rocks which looked to be like boulders to me, just all the way across the two lanes. And I saw them just soon enough to be able to hold the wheel really good with both hands, and boom, and my front left tire blew out. And, you know, and I thought, I think we just hurt something. And I glanced over, there are already four other cars pulled over here on the side. And I thought, well, I guess I ought to pull over, and I actually pulled around and parked in that parking lot of that cowboy church right there some of you guys know where that is and you know for for a few minutes I almost kind of wanted to pat myself on the back because I wasn't mad at the guy who had lost that partial load of rocks there on the road and that would have been my instinctive immediate response and so the first thing I thought is okay we don't have AAA anymore we don't have roadside service on our cell phone anymore and then uh I thought, okay, let me look in the phone, and I, I called, uh, uh, I looked up wrecker service in Childress, because I knew I was going to get towed, have to get towed to town to deal with this, and there's one wrecker, and he answered the phone immediately, and he said, I'm on my way, he's an older gentleman, it's got the only wrecker service there, and by the way, great, super guy, he's a member of First Baptist Church, Childress, and uh, so he, he said he's making his way out there to us, in the meantime, I I called because the tire size on our car is an odd-sized tire, and I knew I was going to need a new, a new full tire to replace this. And I actually called Walmart that was still open. The tire center was still open. Auto center there was still open. They had one tire the size that I needed. And so the man gets out there, and my wife and I are sitting there, and, and uh, I'm looking at my watch, I'm like, okay, we got like a 10-minute window for him to get here and get us there in time for us to get there before Walmart closes. Because they, they ain't staying open late for anybody. You know what I'm saying? So I knew I had to get there and get this fixed. And he came right in time, loaded us up, got there, got the new tire. And, and I, honestly, I was pretty proud of myself. Because I hadn't blown up emotionally like I might have tended to do at other times in my life. So I was pretty proud. But then you know what I noticed a couple hours later and several hundred dollars later as I'm driving, as we get into town and then I get home last night, the emotion was eating me up on the inside. <laughs> and I might not have shown it. Jenna might disagree. She might think that I did, but I thought I was hiding it pretty well. But it was eating me up on the inside. And sometimes that's even worse. Sometimes when we, we have those emotions and we, we withhold them and don't deal with them, that they can be even more detrimental to us. The emotion we're going to talk about this morning as we wrap up this series is this very first 
emotional temptation that we find face in the Bible, the emotion of envy, is not something that typically causes us to blow up, but it's an emotional uh, reaction that, that kind of takes root in our lives, and it just sits there, and it, it festers, and it grows, and it just kind of gnaws at us. And what envy does to us is it's much more detrimental over the long term unless we learn how to deal with it and how to control it in a biblical way. So that's what we'll look at this morning in Genesis chapter 3. Look with me at the story that is, is probably pretty familiar to many of you. And this is where the serpent comes to Eve in the garden. And if you'll recall back in chapter 2, the Lord had placed Adam and Eve, the first man and woman, in this garden we call the Garden of Eden. It was a, a beautiful place that had all these trees. We just can't even fathom the beauty of the Garden of Eden. And the Lord said, you can have anything in this garden but one tree. This tree of the knowledge of good and evil said, you can't have that, but you can have anything else. And then we get over to chapter 3, and beginning in verse 1, says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say? Now I think that it is perfectly permissible when you're reading any words of the serpent in Scripture that you just load the, the cynicism and load the attitude on there. Because you know that he didn't come up and real sweet, Oh, did God really say? I don't know. Well, maybe so. I, I don't know. But did God really say, you must not eat from any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Verse 6, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. And then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Envy can just take root and lead us down a path of self-destruction. This morning, beginning uh, with this understanding, I want you to see just the, the root of it is found in this story because the root of envy is the lack of humility before God. The root of envy is a lack of humility before God. You, you will not surely die. You will be like God. Whenever we are enticed with that understanding of we can be like God, it just stirred up something within Eve and then with Adam that, that, uh, that caused them to, to not recognize who they were and to lose sight of who they were and who God was and, and envy begins to take root. And that happens in our lives when we begin to think that we are uh, more important than we really are. And envy leads uh, us down unlimited paths of destruction. And this first emotional reaction of envy to the opportunity, the invitation to be like God has led to every form of destruction we've ever seen on the face of the earth. The root of it is found in a lack of recognizing and remaining humble before Almighty God. Well, think with me. Why did God put that one tree there? That one tree. And tell them they could have everything but the tree in the middle of the garden. Not because he was setting them up for failure. God didn't place that one tree and give them that very specific. That, you talk about specific instruction. That's pretty specific instruction, isn't it? God didn't say you can have everything but that one to trick them. And some people have this idea of God. Well, God just sent us these traps out there for us. That he really wants us to fail. No, God does not want us to fail. But God knows this. That any success or maturity or achievement or... Uh, um, contentment that we'll ever find in life 
must be based in acknowledging that he is God and we are not. Any success, contentment, you fill in the blank, anything good in life will never come when we place ourselves as authority in our lives. So the root of envy is a lack of humility before Almighty God. Adam and Eve wanted to have knowledge. They wanted to be on par with God. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? You might say, well, I, I've never thought that I wanted to be equal with God. Well, let me give you a couple of examples to see uh, if you being all high and mighty is really true. H have you ever wanted to know the answer to a challenge in life and you got frustrated because God wouldn't let you in on it? Have you? Have you ever made your plans and then got upset with God because his plans were different from yours? You know what that is that's stirring up within you? That's a desire to be equal, to be on par with God, to understand, to see life, to know what God knows. So really, that's the same inclination with us that Adam and Eve were facing in the garden. This idea that surely, why can't we know all of it, God? God, if you know what's going to happen, go ahead and let me in on it now. Why doesn't he? Because we're not God. And if that was the case, we'd not place our faith and our trust and our daily dependence upon him. And he knows exactly how much uh, he gives us that, that teaches us to rely upon him. Those are examples of us dealing with a struggle to be like God, this constant struggle to humble ourselves before his authority in our lives. And then see this. The loss of emotional control exposes areas of our lives in which we are not fully surrendered to the Lord. Not just envy, but add lust or anger or impatience. You just add any of those elements in there. And when we recognize the areas in which we're struggling, they're simply used by the Spirit of God to convict us of areas in which we are not fully surrendered to Him. So taking you back to, to the, the topic of the day, as we deal with envy, as you recognize that you're envious of what another person has or success that another person has achieved, as you recognize that you're envious of them and the Holy Spirit reveals that to you, oh, I'm envious, I want what they have, and you realize that, that's the Lord showing us that that's a specific area of our life in which we're not fully surrendered to Him. We're saying, God, I'm surrendered to you for salvation, but the kind of car I drive, Lord, listen, I really ought to be driving one like that guy. I ought to be living in the house like that guy. Or I ought to have the bank account that that guy has. And when we realize that those are areas in which we are prone to becoming envious, those are areas in our lives, areas of contentment, if you will, areas of security, areas of trust, Areas of materialism, things like that, that God's saying, hey, you haven't fully surrendered this part of your life to me. So it's important for us to see that the root of envy is a lack of humility and a lack of surrender, if you will, before God. Secondly, this morning, envy takes root in your heart and grows into contentment in all areas of life. So it might just be that car, it might just be that job, it might just be that, that one element that you think is the one thing you're envious about, but it begins to take root, and those roots start spreading out, and it impacts every area of your life. That lack of contentment uh, manifests itself in a lack of satisfaction in your job. See, well, my job, I, I don't have what he has, so it must be my job's fault. And then that dissatisfaction there sometimes laps over into your marriage. Say, well, I don't have what he has, so it must be my job's fault, and then my spouse is not, you know, sure, why don't they bring this to the table? I mean, why, why aren't these problems there? And then we begin to, to have general dissatisfaction across the board. It's not just that one area anymore, but it's taken root in our heart, and envy is uh, it, it, it's cancerous. 
in that it multiplies and it spreads and impacts so many different areas uh, of our lives. Let me, let me move on down here. When you see another person who is successful and you want to strive for that, that's not envy. If you see a, a, something someone has and you go, oh, that'd be wonderful to have, that's, that's not wrong. That's not sinful. But if you see what that other person has and it causes you to think, well, they don't deserve it, but I deserve it. See the difference? Say, that's a, that's a nice new truck that you have. Pfft, they don't deserve that truck. They're just going to tear it up. You know what I'm talking about? So it's not, it's not sinful to desire improvement. It's not sinful to want better things or to seek advancement in the workplace or whatever it is. But if we let that affect us and impact us in a way that leads us to sin, to a sinful impression of another person, that's when it's crossed over. So don't say uh, that, that it's wrong to, to want a, a new car. Don't say that it's wrong to want, you know, a new uh, lazy boy that's not held together with duct tape. I mean, those things, it's not wrong necessarily to want new or different things. But when we either act on it by sin or it leads us to have a sinful impression of another person that that's that's when it has crossed the line now let me say this before i move on lest you think that envy is something that poorer people always have of richer people and in no other area let me let me quickly correct you the most envious people I have ever lived and served around in my life would be considered wealthy people. Because the things they pursued, it just was never enough. How much is enough? You know, on the opposite side, the most contented people that I've ever lived and not lived with but known or the Haitian Christian people who have nothing. No, you don't understand. They got nothing. <laughs> I mean, nothing in terms of material possessions and even in terms of daily stability and security. I, there's never been a day, I mean, you can look at me and tell this, there's never been a day in my life where I worried about where my food was going to come from. Not once. But there are Haitian believers that deal with that every day. Yet they are the most contented people that I've ever met. So, the trappings of materialism just lead to greater sources of envy. If you say, well, but if I had that job, or if I had that raise, or if I had that paycheck, then all this would be satisfied, you are absolutely fooling yourself. Because what you're doing is just putting a temporary Band-Aid over a, over a sore that's not healing over an infection that needs a little more direct action. Continue on with me to number three that will come up on the screen. Envy destroys your health physically and spiritually. Destroys your health physically and spiritually. Uh, God said, if you eat this, uh, you will die, back in chapter 2. Then the enemy says, oh, you won't surely die. But it does destroy you, disobedience acting upon that emotion in a sinful manner brings death to your life. It brings the immediate result of spiritual death. Adam and Eve experience immediate spiritual death by guilt and shame. That's why they became the first clothing designers. Because they experienced shame. They recognized what they had done caused them to be guilty. That's spiritual death. That's immediate spiritual death. Not even talking about ultimate, eternal spiritual death that comes as a result of sin. For the wages of sin is death, 
but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. The wages of sin is death. It was immediate result. But also, acting upon this emotion in a sinful manner uh, brought about uh, impending death. Impending physical death. So immediate spiritual death and impending physical death. Adam and Eve didn't die right here in the garden, but we know they died. And we know that every person since them has died. And we know that things decay, that things die. Death was brought into the world as a result of their sin. So acting upon sin, specifically acting upon envy, brings about immediate spiritual death and it brings about impending uh, physical death. Death. There, there's a book that came out, oh, probably maybe 30 years ago now, called None of These Diseases. Dr. S.I. McMullen was the author. He said this, said, Medical science recognizes that emotions such as fear, sorrow, envy, resentment, and hatred are responsible for the majority of our sicknesses. Now, I'm not a doctor, and I don't even play one on TV, but he is exactly right. And you know we all have experienced some of those things in our lives. One patient uh, told his doctor one day, or, or, or one patient came in and he just was feeling sick all the time and just couldn't get over it. doctor started talking to him and finally the doctor looked at him and said, here's the problem. He said, if you don't cut out your resentments, I'm going to have to cut out your intestines. Because the man's stress and resentment and, and sinful bitterness that he was carrying was destroying him physically. We're kidding ourselves if we don't think. Now, that I'm not saying, and nowhere is anybody saying that every uh, problem, physical problem you have is a result of sin in your life. Not saying that. But sin does impact us physically. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 30, says, A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. A heart of peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. So, I don't think any of us would disagree that envy is wrong, but what do we do about it? Let me give you, let me give you four just practical things you can do to, to, to seek to control. It's impossible, I would say, to totally eradicate that temptation from your life, that emotion that we experience because the desire for improvement, those are, those are good emotions. But when it crosses over and it becomes detrimental, we need to learn how to control that. So here are four principles to control envy in your life. Number one, minimize exposure to things or people that cause you to be envious and maximize exposure. Minimize exposure to things that cause you to be envious and maximize exposure to those things that bring joy and contentment. Several weeks ago, I, I spent a little while talking about uh, uh, social media and about some practices we should, ways that we should be careful and seek to honor God. And listen, uh, we need to be, we need to stop being obsessed and fixating upon what everyone else does. We need to stop being fixated and obsessed with everything everybody has. And you know how it works? There are certain people that you follow on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or whatever it is, and you follow them and you go, man, they got, their life is so good. No, it's not. That's just all they want you to see. <laughs> they got junk that they're not putting out there. Well, now, some people do put it out there. And you just go, quit putting your emotions on your sleeve. But there are some, you know what I'm talking about, some that just everything in their life just looks glorious. No, it's not. So stop fixating upon that person or those things and thinking that will satisfy. And maybe you need to get off Facebook, or maybe you need to quit following that person or quit being consumed with what that other person is experiencing, or... The other side is that not just take away, but add to. And I don't know, is Janice up there? Jan there she is up there. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Janice Tucker up in the balcony. If you're on Facebook, you need to follow that lady. 
Because nobody has more joy in the thing she posts than that lady right up there. So quit being so fixated upon the things that just drive you crazy and find some people like Janice to follow that every time it just, she's a life giver. She's a joy giver. I can't read something she puts up there without just cracking up laughing. Or you might look at her today and go, the preacher doesn't have a sense of humor because she's not funny. No, it's, her stuff is, it's flat out hilarious. Well, anticipate also your reactions to relational encounters. When you know that you're going to work, you're going to work tomorrow morning, and you're going to have to sit by that person, and they're going to tell you all the things they did this weekend, and you know it's going to drive you crazy. Well, anticipate that and prepare yourself for that relational encounter so that you're well-suited and you have your spiritual guard up so that those envious temptations don't, don't get in and stir you up. Let me move on. Number two, give thanks for the position in which God has placed you at this moment because he desires to use it to conform you to his character. Give thanks to God for your station in life for the position that he has placed you in currently. And your current position might not be that comfortable. Your current position might not be all that wonderful. But if you will train yourself and discipline yourself to give thanks to God in all circumstances, then in the midst of those circumstances, what you recognize is God is building his character in your life. Your character is never going to be fully conformed to his image as long as you resist the challenges of life. As long as you resent the hard times that come. Those things are going to come. But God uses those to conform your character to his. 1 Thessalonians 5, 18. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will concerning you. Number three. Ask God to bless those with whom you are envious. So I'm not about to pray for that guy. I've said this before in other uh, different type contexts, but you can't stay mad at somebody that you're praying for. And if you're praying for God to bless a person, rather than being envious, say, God, it's, Lord, thank you for being so good to them. You know what happens in your life when you thank God for blessing another person? He gives you step number four, which is contentment. Number four, find your sufficiency in Christ. One last place to look before we finish this morning. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, we, we get to verse 13 and there's this verse that is so misquoted. I mean, it is so misquoted. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Don't get me wrong, it's a great verse. But it's not a verse to be quoted right before you go out onto the playing field, like that's going to give you the power to win the game. Not at all the intent of that scripture. But if you'll read a couple of verses before that, beginning in verse 11, Paul says that, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. And I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether fed, whether well fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13 is not a verse to be quoted to win every worldly battle we face, but Philippians 4.13 is a verse that is a source of hope and contentment in life. Paul said, listen, I've had a lot and I've had nothing. And I've learned the secret of being content. I can do all things through Christ. The secret of standing against and resisting those temptations to be envious of what other people have and their successes and so forth is finding your sufficiency in Christ. He is enough. Listen, 
Because Jesus is a beautiful name. Jesus is a powerful name. And Jesus is a wonderful name. That's the secret of contentment. Is finding it in the person of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is all we need.